Some people say that artificial intelligence is going to make the human race obsolete. And a lot of people don't really want to think about AI, artificial intelligence, kind of an intimidating subject. Um, but you know, the thing about AI is, uh, even if you don't want to think about it, it's thinking about you, or is it? Well, that'll be the kind of question we'll discuss today on this episode of Independent Conversations. Greetings, everybody who's joined us. I'm Graham Walker coming to you from the Independent Institute here in Oakland, California. Uh, we try and bring notable experts on a variety of topics to discuss the topics of the day. And we think giving you a perspective that you're not likely to hear elsewhere. And today we're going to be talking with George Gilder. Let me welcome George Gilder to Independent Conversations. Hi, George. Great to be here. It's a pleasure to see you again. <laughs> see, I, I met George Gilder first. I met you first. I think it was sort of deep in the winter of maybe January of 1982 in Western New York. And you had recently published um, Wealth and Poverty, like the year before, I think. Wasn't Wealth and Poverty published in 1981, George? Uh, 1980. 80, okay. 1980, uh, which was a fabulous Actual, book. Yeah. And I think President Reagan loved the book, if I remember hearing he read it at some point. Did you hear that story? Yeah, I mean, he wrote me letters about it bef before publication. He got, he read articles, oh. excerpts from it. It was excerpted all over the place before it came out. And it made me uh, President Reagan's most quoted living author. Wow. Is, but, uh, <laughs> Well, it was a fabulous book. I mean, the yeah. whole part, your, your creativity in seeing what others didn't see about the system of free exchange, so-called capitalism, when you analogized it to um, what was the exchange thing among the Native American tribes? Well, there was Tanamoshi. That's the Japanese one. There are a whole bunch of uh, different ways that... Uh, Where the, the tribes would get together and they would simply give and share. Yeah. Um, which was fascinating. And you, you pointed out yeah. that there is a lot of that in what we call capitalism, which therefore doesn't pivot simply on self-interest, but rather on something at least akin to benevolence. That was a, a, really an eye-opener to me, George. Thank you. Well, I've, I uh, enjoyed writing Wealth and Poverty, and I've been doing uh, various elaborations on it ever since. I mean, my technology books really sprang from life, from uh, Wealth and Poverty, which focused on creativity and yeah. the image of our creator as the great force in uh, economic growth. And since then, I've been working on the information theory mm -hmm. of economics. Which, I remembered the term I was trying to think of a moment ago. Um, I think you described it as the potlatch, wasn't it? Yeah, the potlatch. Pot yeah. yeah, the potlatch. That That's, was really amazing. Um, and anyway. it helped me too because I was a college student at the time, or you know, just after being a college student, and I was, you know, having a lot of tussles with my peers and professors who all thought that socialism was just the coolest thing there ever was. <laughs> uh, and, and they usually portrayed capitalism in very distorted uh, terms. And so you gave me a whole new vocabulary. I was grateful wow, for that. Wow. Well, thank you. So people said you're an economist, but then sometimes you seem like you're a sociologist because you, you wrote Men in Marriage. And then other people say that you're a technologist and a futurist. What are you, George? I'm, I'm a historian. Ah, <laughs> okay. But they call well, Wiki calls me a techno utopian futurist. I have no idea why, <laughs> but anyway, uh, I'll, I'm willing to play the role that uh, is imposed on me. Um, those are, but. Uh, well, we're glad. I, we're, I, I, I really probably. I, believe in a hierarchical universe, and I believe it's helpful to have a philosophical perspective mm -hmm. that unifies all these different fields right. and uh, thus allows you to transcend this fragmentation of uh, analysis that afflicts all the universities where everybody has his own special specialization many of them with different jargons and idioms of expression that uh, even 
exacerbate the fragmentation of knowledge. Yeah, they really do. And your work has really always been characterized by the integration rather than the fragmentation, uh, yeah. which makes sense. I think that partly is what must have driven you to be one of the co-founders of the Discovery Institute in Seattle, because they have Discovery had that, Institute, yeah. yeah. I mean, they seem to have quite a synthetic understanding of the sciences there. Is that right? Yep, that's what we try to do. We try to bring the sciences together and uh, and uh, economics is just another part of uh, biology, which is another part of physics, which is all subsumed in a cosmic vision that we're going to expound at our COSM conference ah. on November 10th to 12th. Peter Thiel is going to be the Whoa. keynote, and we got Kai Fu Lee speaking on artificial intelligence, and uh, Bob Metcalf of Metcalf's Law is going to be expounding on the continued significance for cryptocurrencies and other such um, paths of technological advance. We're going to have an exciting time at COSM, and I'm going to debate Newt Gingrich on China. Oh, ho, ho. So that's, um, yeah. I, I don't think war with China uh, it brings any... Uh, benefits that I can imagine. I, so I agree with you on that. So, so I mean, what could be less productive than a war with China? Good grief. Yeah. So if, if our viewers want information about that conference, where should they go, George? Cosm.technology, Cosm just Cosm.technology. So the um, dot tech technology is the suffix. Yeah, that's right. Cosm, C-O-S-M, Cosm.technology. Okay. Cosm you can go there to find out about this conference that's going on. Is it next month, did you say, or November, George? In November. In November, November okay. uh, 10th to 12th. Great. Well, okay. So in the meanwhile, you're also releasing a brand new book. I think the publication date is officially October 15th, if I'm not mistaken. But um, here's the title. Here's the, the cover of it. Gaming AI, why AI can't think but can transform jobs. Very nice and compelling cover. You have some good artists working with you, George. <laughs> good. Well, thank you. And um, I, I also noticed that if you want to go to um, Amazon, you can order it already. Apparently, they've got some in stock, it seems like. So, oh, yeah. uh, it's been out for a little for a while. Oh, OK. Uh, so that's why they've got some in stock. So let's yeah. talk about that book. I mean, I, I got a copy of it, <clears throat> and I was utterly fascinated by the way that you <clears throat> take up the standard challenge and kind of turn it in a direction that people don't expect. I mean, the standard challenge, so, I mean, you mentioned early in the book that some people think that AI is going to be for sure a demotion of the human race. And I think on page 20 of the book, this is a very arresting quote caught my, my eye where you quoted the late Stephen Hawking, who pronounced the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. Uh, well, well, that's what Hawking said. Uh, and uh, Elon Musk, who's alive today, uh, says that uh, AI is more dangerous than nukes. And uh, yeah, and I, I and uh, I really and a lot of people talk about a singularity to mm -hmm. come. And this was really predicted way back at at Bletchley Park mm -hmm. by. Um, Alan uh, Turing? One of Alan Tur no, Alan Turing's colleague, Jay Good, Jack Good. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said that once we invent artificial intelligence, that'll be the last invention we'll ever have to make because a true artificial intelligence would be capable of creating machines, intelligent machines that could outperform the original artificial intelligence and thus release a cascade of tech of intelligence through the universe. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and uh, and, and culminating the, the theory was it would culminate in this so-called singularity, which yeah, I think right. that's supposed to be where basically the artificial intelligence takes off, takes up where we left off and says goodbye to us, right? Yeah, that's really what uh, good was predicting. And uh, 
and uh, Ray Kurzweil and Werner Vinge and uh, a lot of people have developed the idea further. Ray Kurzweil in a very sophisticated way. He's a friend of mine, uh, lives in the Berkshires some of the time. Oh, really? And, uh, I thought he was just Silicon I, Valley. No, he, well, he's, uh, he was a technology chief at Google mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, developed the uh, AI that responds to your emails. You know, Gmail mm -hmm. has uh, responses that, allow you to anti that anticipate how you're going to respond to a particular email. I noticed those responses have been getting more courteous and more specific. I suppose it's due to his, uh, his development, yeah, huh? That, that's, that's Ray's contribution. I mean, Ray is, as a whole skein of contributions to technology over the decades. But I think all these people have forgot, forgotten the fundamental principles of the computer science that they expound. Uh, well, well, that's what's striking about this book, because you don't seem to be as much of a doomsayer as some. In fact, you, you seem to, if I've got this right, you seem to think that the potential of AI may be oversold but that even in the overselling, there could be some collateral damage, and you're trying to avoid that. Have I got that right? Uh, yeah, I think that's right. I mean, this uh, the idea that somehow AI competes with uh, human minds is a fundamental illusion. Well, no, which... a, lot, a lot of these technology creators, uh, they came to their work having already absorbed the idea that the human mind is nothing more than a meat machine. No. And so if, if, if they knew that, quote unquote, knew that to begin with, then it's not surprising that their conception of artificial intelligence could be this singularity thing that totally transcends the human mind. Because if the human mind was never anything more than meat and no. electrons to begin with, then not, you could surpass it. But I think your point about the history of technology is that the human mind uh, demonstrates that it must be more than just meat and electrons. Yeah, well, my uh, when I was uh, writing about the Internet, which I did from the early, early 80, late 80s on through its development and the launch of all the f webs of sand and glass and air around mm. the globe, mm -hmm. uh, I used to do connect tomes. Uh, how that many? Mean? That's uh, a way of mapping all the connections of the global internet, and and uh, and the connectome for the global internet as of uh, a couple of years ago took about two zettabytes to map. You know, if you map all the connections in the global internet, it was about two zettabytes. And um, recently, Can you re remind, me what a zeta, remind me what a zettabyte is, is. 10 I'm... to the 21, okay, 21 zeros, Thank essentially. You. I mean, just a number beyond easy imagination. Mm -hmm. um, and recently, uh, an MIT campaign has been trying to map uh, all the connections in a single human brain. And uh, this uh, has been really difficult. Because, How many zettabytes does that take? Well, that's the question. <laughs> uh, they, they start with a nematode worm, which is the um, uh, a friend of mine was on Sidney Brenner's team that first uh, developed uh, DNA codes that imagined that that uh, DNA was a code and worked out what the code would be. And, and he's been mapping the brain of a nematode worm for uh, some 20 years at the University of Wisconsin. And at uh, Thanksgiving dinner the other year, last year or so, he t told me that the more he studies the connectome of the nematode worm, the less he understands the wow. nematode brain. But 
the folks at MIT have taken uh, his con- his estimates of the uh, connections in a nematode worm and and uh, applied it to the brain of a human being, which all the synapses and dendrites and axons and neurons and connections and all kinds in the brain. And it turns out it takes a couple of zettabytes to map all the connections in a human brain. Mm-hmm. So it suggests that a single human mind or brain is as densely and complexly connected as the whole global internet is. But wow. the global global internet takes gigawatts of energy right. to, uh, to, and it's so, uh, you know, a data center takes, uh, has to be next to a, a glacier to deal with the, uh, uh, heat problems. I mean, it, it, generally, the chief uh, and dominant technology at a data center is all the cooling systems to take away the heat that that these uh, machines emit. I'm, I don't and seem to single, have a you, single human yeah. brain <laughs> functions with uh, 12 to 14 watts. Yeah, and I'm just at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't yeah, seem to yeah, need yeah, any ex- extra cooling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's uh, and uh, and so the so it really the I believe that technologies function to the extent that they uh, augment and extend uh, human capabilities rather than attempting to compete mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. human capabilities, let alone usurp. Right. Human capabilities. I think companies in Silicon Valley that regard their business plan as obsoleting their customers and uh, contributors are uh, are going to fail. And yeah, so, if that's how they approach it, then yeah. they're going to make themselves superfluous. Yeah. And in fact, yeah. they, they seem to anticipate that. So if, if you proceed in business on the assumption that your job is to make your own customers superfluous, you're going to run out of things to do if that's your business model, aren't you? No, I, I mean, I think it's just quite absurd. I don't say, I, I mean, I'm even uh, contrarian enough to not believe that uh, I think technology is continuing to advance at a tremendous pace, but I don't think it's advancing any more rapidly than it did at the time of uh the uh, Industrial Revolution. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that uh, Nobel laureate economist William Nordhaus uh, did a study of the advance of lighting. Mm-hmm. You know, this is the invention creation of, of light, the amount of lumens you need to uh, light a room at night. And and he shows that the advance in lighting has been a hundred thousand times more rapid than is measured in the economic models. Essentially, economists, while they were writing about dim satanic mills, dark satanic mills, and and uh, William Blake, yeah, you know, and all the uh, various. Uh, images of the dismal science and uh, missed the incredible expansion of light from the time it was piles of of fire fire in a cave to the millions of candles at Versailles to whale Mm. oil to kerosene to uh, finally electricity and then light emitting diodes, whatever right, it was, beyond but, electricity. They, but, but measured by the amount of time a worker had to spend to uh, buy the light to illuminate a room, uh, economic progress was 100,000 times more rapid than mm-hmm. is usually estimated in that particular in that field so and, even looking and so so we were missing during the 
Industrial Revolution, we miss light. And uh, I think in this uh, intellectual, in the current AI revolution, we're missing mind. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. And, uh, and it's uh, and the, and and measured by the number of hours it takes a worker to earn the money to purchase the goods and services that sustain his life. Uh, the this is a, continues to be a, a, a golden age of capitalism mm -hmm. with uh, with the. Um, I can, with technological progress f as fast as ever and with increasing equality because uh, uh, poor people benefit more from the expansion of the hours of their day to do other things mm -hmm. than uh, rich people already just have to spend a, a few minutes to earn their food and clothing and whatever. And so uh, as technology advances, it benefits the masses most. And, uh, and AI is just the new, newest manifestation of the advances of the computer industry mm -hmm. since the time of Turing and Good at Bletchley Park through uh, uh, John von Neumann, who... Uh, was uh, probably a paramount figure and anticipated the gigahertz machines we have today. Mm -hmm. And uh, he really was the first person to uh, imagine Moore's law that we could really uh, produce thinking machines that operated at billions of cycles a second. Let me just step back a, a couple steps. And something you said a, a minute ago really deserves some, some uh, I think, extra attention. You commented a moment ago that uh, technological and economic advance um, tends to have a comparatively greater impact of benefit to the worse off uh, because the worse off have further to go up. And so the, rel the comparative improvement in their life it can be greater. That, that's intriguing. When, a few years ago, I was in East Africa uh, in Uganda and traveling around Kampala and some of the rural areas in that part of Uganda. It was very striking to me, of course, the standard of living, obviously much lower than the United States. And I saw many people uh, living in huts, not having sufficient clothing, uh, not having you know sufficient uh, covering from the rain. Um, people clearly you know, struggling although there was a lot of economic activity. And at the same time, every single person sitting under every insufficiently corrugated tin roof on every little sh shop, on every little byway or alleyway had a cell phone. <laughs> yeah. Every and, single and person and has and a cell phone. And increasingly, it's a smartphone. Yep. And, and they uh, use that them. Means, that means a supercomputer. That means an underestimation of their real standard of living. That's right. By the same kind of factor of 100,000 that Nordhaus had identified during the Industrial Revolution with the expansion of light. It's another form of the expansion of light. I noticed that Ugandan roads were still pretty bad and needed to be repaved. But at the same time, I also realized that everybody in Kampala can now talk to their grandma or great grandma out in the back country yeah. anytime they want to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because everyone, even in the small villages, has the cell phones and they're also using the smartphones as a medium of payment and exchange, yeah. greatly simplifying monetary transactions. Um, yeah. it, it was really quite stunning, honestly. Yeah. Uh, and made me proud to be a Northern Californian. Yeah. Well, you're, you're correct to be proud and it's, it is a really what's bizarre is the argument that you see a lot of places that uh, the middle class is suffering. You know, the, as a result of, uh, of uh, a stagnation of technology or uh, whatever is the claim of the moment, that, that uh, inequality is vastly expanding. Uh, you know, once you make uh, have a, a few 
score $1,000. That takes care of all your uh, essential needs. And you live like live a lot better than a king of uh, previous yeah, centuries. Yeah, used to do. Mm-hmm. If you if you have that smartphone and uh, access to medical care that it implies, and and uh, ultimately the access to a whole world civilization that it manifests, and and so uh, it's. Uh, rich people, uh, that all their uh, so-called wealth is really knowledge. It's it's invested. Mm-hmm. It's not liquid. Right. If they if they liquidate it, ultimately it disappears. Mm-hmm. In cap in capitalism, you only get to keep what you give away. Mm-hmm. Uh, that is because you because unless you're Wealth is invested and is working, is providing jobs and and opportunities for others. It uh, loses value and ultimately disappears. So, so One, this is this is really a fundamental principle of uh, capitalism, and and it's manifested today in the phenomenal creativity that you saw in uganda mm-hmm. and uh we have a number of people on with us uh george uh, uh simultaneously although we may also share this this recording later but one of our current participants just sent a little note in uh commenting that uh, an organization or a company called celera technologies in san jose is a good example of the kind of thing you're t- talking about you know celera technologies by any chance how, how do you spell it? C E L E R A. Yeah, I have heard of Solera technology. I'm trying to. I, I was thinking of Cerebras, but oh. I, or Cerebras, or right. I, which I think is a more formidable accomplishment. It's a uh, it's a uh, wafer scale integration of AI and machine learning capabilities on a single chip, not the size of your thumbnail, Mm -hmm. but of the size of a dinner plate Mm -hmm. and uh, trillions of transistors on a single uh, uh, wafer. And uh, I and I I really and somehow I can't remember what the heck Solera does. Uh, It's (laughs) Something good, apparently. He should tell you if, if we're going to talk about it. Yeah, he, we'll, we'll see if the person... your guy tell him tell us which which company that is. Okay, I, I'm watching the comment box. We'll see. Okay. But you know, one of the great arguments in the book uh, "Gaming AI" is your point um, that those in the high tech industries who are well obsessed, maybe or maybe captivated, is a nicer word with this idea of moving toward a singularity where the created intelligence surpasses human mind and so forth and makes the human mind obsolete. Um, They seem, you argue, to have forgotten the history of their own industry. That's right. Now, can you can you tell me something about that in a way that I as a layman can understand? How does the development of high tech industry itself illustrate your point about the irreducible need for the, the creativity of the human mind. Can you tell yeah. me something about that in that industry's history? Yeah. Well, uh, I brought up John von Neumann, who was the great figure who uh, imagined that you could make mathematics completely self-sufficient. That was his agenda as a young man, was to render mathematics a completely self-sufficient and complete and a coherent system. Mm -hmm. And uh, he met this young uh, uh, student named Kurt Gödel, who I really believe was the inventor of the computer science of Mm -hmm. our day. Because Kurt Gödel, uh, in 1931, I believe, uh, at Konigsberg, introduced a paper which showed that mathematics was intrinsically and inexorably dependent on axioms or propositions that couldn't be 
proven within the system itself. So therefore, it couldn't be a fully self-contained system. It could not be a self-contained system. And John von Neumann, who was the greatest, in my judgment, the greatest mind that uh, uh, we've produced over the last uh, couple centuries, uh, von Neumann immediately concluded from this, he was the only one who really understood Gödel's paper. And he, he not only saw that this meant that, that thinking machines would always be necessarily dependent on outside programmers or oracles, as Alan Turing defined it. That, uh, and when they asked Alan Turing, who was the inventor of the universal computer architecture with von Neumann, that that uh, currently uh, dominates our lives. Uh, he said, uh, the, the Oracle, the, well, one thing I can tell you about the Oracle is it can't be a machine. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, and von Neumann, by the way, uh, those are von, it's the von Neumann computer architecture that that still runs most of our systems. But the new architecture is a massively parallel architecture that really originated with graphics processors and is currently taken over those data centers. And uh, it, it was also invented by von Neumann. So the point so it, being- It's called again, a non-von machine, but it was non invented by, by von Neumann. I mean, and, as a, and, and he understood that artificial intelligence did not compete with human minds. Mm -hmm. It was a ne necessary expression of the capabilities of human minds being extended into the world. Right. Uh, it, it actually is an extension, not a replacement. Yeah. Uh, well, what you said a moment ago really um, is a way of capturing it. Tell me again who it was who uh, made the point that all this developed machine intelligence would have to have a human mind as if it were an oracle. Who who said yeah. the oracle business? That was who? that was Turing. That was Alan Turing. That was Alan Turing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So so it's a very striking metaphor because it means that uh, to put it maybe in sort of simple but historical terms, um, uh, we are our human minds are to machine intelligence what uh, the Oracle of Delphi was thought to be to the yeah. men of antiquity. In other okay, words, yeah. a form of knowledge mysteriously outside the realm of grasping. So you would okay. go to the Oracle in, in Thebes, and you know it probably was a bunch of hooey, but nevertheless, they would go <laughs> there, and, and they thought they were receiving insight, which they couldn't possibly get from yeah, inside yeah. human minds. And so the, hu the human mind, in turn, is to the artificial intelligence the way the Oracle of Thebes was to humans of yeah. that day. That's a fascinating uh, metaphor. Yeah. And, and all this, th this insight ultimately uh, ex uh, is an extension of Charles Sanders' purse's uh, proposition that all information is triadic. It can't be binary. If it's binary, it's restricted to symbol systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, symbols, if it's triadic, so there's, it... there's no necessary connection between symbols, as in mathematics, and objects such as the objects of the world. In order to connect a symbol system to the real world, you need an intermediating mind, a human, a conscious human brain. It's sort of like two dimensions versus three dimensions. That's right. Uh, and, Binary uh, versus and, triadic. Exactly. And, and we have uh, a flat universe society prevailing in Silicon Valley. They imagine that they're binary symbol shufflers which can play games a lot better than us because a game is a symbol system. And so there's, there's on the go board, they're just those black and gray, white and gray stones. 
and those stones are symbols and uh, they don't point beyond the board. If, if a computer can move those stones billions of times faster than a human can, obviously they can play Go better than uh, a human, just as a, a threshing machine can... Uh, your point, I think, is that a man threshing, of course, is going to be superseded by a threshing machine, but yeah. man with a single scythe. But yeah. that doesn't mean that somehow the threshing machine is more sophisticated than the man. That's right. Well, so you say uh, early on in the book, and, and you repeat it a few different places, that you have two basic claims, that this, this notion of um, sort of supremacy of artificial intelligence, you say it's both dumb and self-defeating. So we've been dealing with the dumb part. Um, and I find it reassuring to learn from you and your book and other sources that the human mind actually is more complex than maybe the entire world internet system. That's reassuring. I'm glad to know that maybe there's some evidence that I'm, my mind is more than just a meat machine with some electrons pulsing through it. But uh, that's reassuring. So maybe it's dumb, but, but the trouble is, could this view, George, this view of artificial, artificial intelligence uh, rising to a supremacy over everything, could it be self-defeating? I mean, I get that it's mistaken, but how could it be self-defeating? What could it undermine to think about it the way that these guys are thinking about it? Because, because they, they try to replace their customers and their necessary complements. I mean, this this computer technology that they're creating and which is an expression of their genius and human imagination and ability to uh, have counterfactual projection and, and uh, to imagine what doesn't already exist or is not already in the program. That's the uh, human part, right? Yeah, that's the human part. It's why, it, why the... Uh, the medical, uh, you know, everybody, decades ago, um, I was introduced to a Dr. Weed who invented a diagnostic machine using a uh, IBM mainframe, or maybe it was a digital mini computer, I don't know. But the idea was that inevitably, inexorably, uh, the machine learning or artificial intelligence would excel all human diagnosticians. Uh -huh. And, and that, uh, and uh, it's not, it's shot, once the symbols are prepared, once you sort all the inputs for the machine uh, and uh, get them all categorized and tagged correctly, then uh, an algorithm can uh, function at billions of cycles a second and uh, produce an answer. But, but uh, much of the intelligence is that mediation mm -hmm. between the textures of the real world mm -hmm. and the symbols that express it within the machine. And uh, and when we're now we now have the illusion of quantum computing. I wrote a book about quantum. You compute, did. What, what compute. was the title of that book? That was called Microcosm. Okay. And that that I published in 1990, I think 89, 1989, and and Microcosm was called the Quantum Era in Economics and Technology, and. Uh, and of course, it's the quantum era. The whole semiconductor industry, which microcosm described and its history, was based on manipulating matter from the inside in accordance with quantum principles. And so all technology, all our uh, computer technology is... Uh, based on quantum physics. That's uh, that quantum physics is the theory of the microcosm, the nanocosm, the picocosm, whatever. <laughs> the problem and the problem is uh, connecting these 
the system to the real world. Now, uh, what the quantum, what they call qu the quantum computer does is, uh, is abandon the binary uh, on off switches of, of uh, Boolean logic that have been the salvation of computers uh, and uh, use qubits, which are mm. uh, uh, more complex analog systems. And so quantum is quantum computing is really a return to analog computing. Mm -hmm. And analog computing was uh, displaced by digital computing, not because analog computing wasn't faster, I mean, and, and more capacious and, and, uh, and it didn't correspond more closely with the real world. Uh, but because uh, in analog, analog computing, making a model, an analog model of the world uh, takes endless detailed mapping of, of the real territories and textures mm -hmm. of, of our actual existence onto the computer. And, and so analog computing, uh, quantum computing, is terrific, uh, but it imposes the whole burden on uh, the human minds that program it. Mm -hmm. the, now, I'm, the, problem, I'm just... the problem gets moved from the symbol right. realm right. into the analog realm where it, where it uh, incurs all the complexities and quantum uncertainties and, and Schrodinger's uh, C cats that uh, populate <laughs> the quantum world. So the, the human mind, again, layman's term here, the human mind can sort of set up closed systems, which can then maybe run artificially better than the human brain could run them. But what that closed system can't do is imagine and create systems that are outside of the closed system. And the human mind seems to be able to triadically transcend closed systems of meaning um, and introduce new uh, angles. And that's what generates and powers creativity. And if those people in charge of these industries deprecate the role of human mind and creativity, they may end up putting their own enterprise on the road to, uh, well, if not failure, at least less creativity. Is that right? I think that's beautifully stated. That's <laughs> <laughs> and and I think that uh, uh, that creativity always comes as a surprise to us. Uh, now I the, hope uh, that your your colleagues in this industry over across the bay here in Silicon Valley, which is not far from where we are here at the Independent Institute uh, on the other side of San Francisco Bay, I hope that they pay attention to you because if not, and if you're right, it might be that they will be overtaken. Um, in creativity because they'll be deprecating the very qualities that made their own business work, which yeah. seems like it would be a terrible shame. They should yeah. pay attention to George Gilder. Um, well, they, one thing they could, they could pay attention to the history of their own industry. And, there you go, yeah. And, and um, pay attention to the, uh, to the hierarchical universe. This, mm -hmm. this idea that the human mind is a product of random fluctuations of uh, molecules is a uh, delusion to begin with. And it's, it's this belief that the human mind is a product of random uh, evolutionary forces that, uh, that uh, really stultifies them. Yeah, stultify, uh, that's, it, the, it, that's it, the word. It makes them think that they can duplicate their minds with a machine, uh, but uh, the mind is is almost infinitely more complex than the machines that they're building even today. So, and, to those of us who and are, they don't understand it at all. Th those of us, in some ways, who are friends of the creative technological enterprise. Um, 
we would encourage our our colleagues, as it were, in creativity, not to underestimate their own minds That's by, right. b by buying into this really ridiculously reductive idea that the mind is nothing but a random set of physical mechanics. Yeah. Uh, they got to move to life after Google. So this is your immediate prior book, uh, Life uh, after, after, Google, after Google, highly recommended, which is related to this new book, Gaming AI. Now, yeah. I'm going I'm to take you somewhere unexpected here, I think. Well, partly because I'm looking at some messages coming from our viewers right now. So, so following on what I just said um, about you know, and you, what you said about the stultifying effects of this, this belief really, this faith that the, the, the mind is nothing other than accidental material, mechanical and physical. Um, so this person says the simplest of mind and the simplest of persons is still more complex than the entire world internet system, it's kind of hard to say there is no God. So that's what this person says. I think that's a good point. But I have another point that's a little different from that, which is this. Let me try this on you, George, because as I was reading your book, this thought really struck me, which is that um, there is always has been in the history of our civilization something of a tension, um, if not always opposition, between a, a mindset which is empirical in nature and a mindset which is spiritual uh, and pious in nature. And so that's why people say religion and science have been in each other's way. There's something to that. But what I'm seeing right now, based upon your analysis, is that there is a new spiritual or devotional attitude um, about the singularity, um, which may itself form a new opposition between science and religion, the religion now being the religion of singularity, which is getting in the way of act, the actual scientific attitude of creativity. Um, so this is a, a replay in a really unexpected form of an old opposition, or, or is it? I'm thinking it's a replay of a very old opposition, but the, the roles yeah. are reversed uh, because the people who are all gaga over the power of AI to take over everything and to form a singularity, they're so committed to their faith position that they seem to close off their ability to uh, be receptive to other yeah. data. And you're bringing yeah. other data in. You're the scientist, well, they're the priests. Jaron Lanier, who was uh, one of the inventors of virtual reality, did the first virtual reality machines, has done a, a number of, of good books on this subject, Jaron Lanier. And he says, AI makes you stupid, essentially. Ah, <laughs> yeah, that's your point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very intriguing. Okay, here's another comment from one of our uh, viewers who's on with us right now. Uh, this person, uh, Jennifer, says, let's hear something about AI and its military implications. Drone technology and the ability to select targets without human interaction for example, do you know enough about this to comment on AI and military applications? Well, I, I know that uh, uh, it, I don't. I think uh, computer. Our whole military is based on computer systems. Uh, Manhattan Project was uh, all modeled on computer systems. It's where uh, Richard Feynman got really immersed in computation was as part of the Manhattan Project. And, and, uh, and uh, Feynman makes the crucial observation uh, that uh, when you're building technology, you better respond to reality because uh, a reality can't be fooled. And the reality is that these machine learning systems are completely dependent on human minds. They do not think at all. And uh, the idea that these machines are somehow thinking as they shuffle bits and bytes is, is a religious belief. And it's a particularly yes, stultifying right. religion of Silicon yeah, That was Valley. my point a moment That's ago. Yeah. yeah, that was my point. So that religious belief is actually means that there's national security danger in deploying artificial intelligence on the assumption that it can think yeah, for itself. That, that would certainly be true. I don't think they're quite doing that uh, yet, but, but they are advancing drones probably too 
quickly. I mean, they they probably are exaggerating their capabilities uh, when the, yeah, if, we learned we, recently yeah. in Kabul. That, yeah, one of them didn't work the way that President Biden yeah. thought it was going to work, and that was pretty yeah. disturbing. Uh, it can't, it, here's it another can't related tell a question. Family of, uh, and a right. group of seven children from a military uh, uh, group. Uh, oh, anyway. Yeah, well, that's disturbing. And moreover, um, but I'm not course, I'm not debunking if, AI. I think AI is great. It's no, just I another know. step in the evolution of the computer industry. It poses no threat to hu human beings. Ex right. Uh, I mean, it the idea that it's comparable to nukes, as uh, Elon Musk describes it, is true only that nukes can be deployed by human minds and AIs could uh, be used to deploy nukes. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, uh, but it's the human mind and the moral order and, and the civilization that uh, keeps us alive. And if we imagine Here that, uh, that our whole civilization is a product of random mutations of uh, of uh, chemistry and physics. I think that's the flat universe mm -hmm. theory. That there's very no, flat. nothing you know, but and I'm just physics and chemistry. And uh, that is uh, stultifying and uh, disabling, ultimately disabling philosophy. We, we spoke a minute, a minute ago of the um, derailed, uh, failed uh, drone strike in Kabul that killed the family with children. And uh, bec you said it wasn't able to distinguish. <clears throat> okay, but you know what's striking to me about that example is that um, if drones were made more sophisticated by their human creators, um, they might be able to make such distinctions, at least approximate them better but the problem is, what if the creators of drone artificial intelligence themself, themselves don't think that human beings are anything special? Yeah. They don't necessarily believe yeah. that there's something special about mothers and children. What if they don't believe that and they're the ones creating the artificial intelligence to run the drones? That yeah, well, scares that is, them. It, all our systems depend on an ultimate moral order and uh, right. mm -hmm. our creativity and the image of our creator. And uh, that's the foundation of human life and progress. And, and it uh, is disabled and crippled by a conception that somehow we're just machines and uh, our machines right, right. can adequately replace us. The, the understanding that our creativity is because we bear this imago Dei of the yeah. creator God is not, as some people think, an obstacle to creativity and progress, but actually may be the yeah, very source is, it, it, of scientific and creativity I, and progress. I agree with that proposition. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of that great book by Stanley Yaki called The Savior mm. of Science. Um, which I think back yeah. in the 1960s, which made that point yeah. uh, before yeah. all this began to happen. Uh, we, we got another interesting comment. We're going to stop soon here, but another interesting comment, one of our participants uh, named Laura, who's actually a friend of mine, I think, uh, she wrote in saying, um, can uh, moral or ethical checks and balances be programmed into AI? Well, you're, you're, it, it implies that the... That, uh, AI has consciousness, uh, the potentiality for a conscience. What it has is a program. And uh, you can mm -hmm. program any set of uh, constraints that you want in the machines that you build, and you have to do it. And I mean, so uh, the answer is y yes, but uh, it's not as if we're programming a moral conscience we're we're programming a right. set of constraints and parameters that can like a series of yeah, proxies right. maybe yeah, for a right. conscience uh, 
way of putting it. <laughs> okay, well, here's one maybe a question that I should pose you and let it be maybe our last. Um, someone named Jacob has, has written in during this uh, broadcast saying, I would like George to provide his insights into the future, what the world will look like in 10 years and 30 years. Oh, okay, George Gilder, futurist, that's yeah, yeah, for well, you to run with. <laughs> my, I, I expect the domination of the theory of, of the information theory of economics, which prohibits really anticipating the future. Uh, uh, the future is based on human creativity. And as uh, Princeton Hirschman uh, declared, uh, creativity always comes as a surprise to us. And, and thus, no deterministic theory of economics, no deterministic theory mm -hmm. of mind can uh, create a new future. And, and, and right. uh, all uh, what differentiates our age from the Stone Age is not a steady refinement of stones. It's an, it's an <laughs> advance of knowledge. Knowledge is wealth. Mm -hmm. Growth is learning. And it's all uh, constrained by the passage of time, which is what remains scarce when all else grows abundant. And so the future will, unless it's going to be just more of the same, uh, in other words, de degeneration, it's got to surprise us. And, and I, mm -hmm. I believe that uh, in 30 years, we're going to live in a world that is, would, is, would be almost incomprehensible in some ways, technologically from the world we live in today. I think we'll go beyond silicon. I think we'll uh, produce and uh, in the our intelligent machines will depend on uh, uh, a new carbon age that uh, uh, just as our brains are consist of carbon, so will our intelligent machines of the future consist of various forms of carbon. They're already, they're okay, already there being go. introduced in the form of carbon nanotubes, uh, graphene mm -hmm. uh, devices, and, and uh, other uh, new hybrid I... materials that, that uh, can simulate intelligence better than our silica, binary silicon machines of today. So I think we'll have a life after silicon in, within 30 years. I think carbon, isn't carbon more plentiful uh, element than silicon? Uh, no, it's, it's less plentiful, but it's more, uh, uh, the three, uh, silicon is great because it's one of the three most common elements in the Earth's ah. crust, which Gordon Moore, uh, the Intel founder believed uh, was providential that uh, silicon, ah, mm -hmm. aluminum, and oxygen are the three most uh, common substances. And um, but uh, but there but I there's enough that... carbon out there. Uh, yeah, there's a lot to, of in order to create <laughs> carbon machines. And, and, and I believe right. that uh, the new substrates of the new intelligent machines will be carbon-based. Uh, at the end of the book, Gaming AI, George, you say uh, these interesting words, and I think I'll stop here. Um, you say an explosion of productivity does not mean an evaporation of work. AI will make people more productive and thus more employable. It will create new and safer and more interesting work. It will generate the capital to endow new companies and new ventures as new technologies have done through history. What it will not do is create a mind. 
Three cheers for the human mind and what it tells us about the universe. Thank you, George Gilder. So grateful for you taking the time. Thank you for writing the book, Gaming AI. Thank you for writing the earlier book, Life After Google, which I recommend. And thanks for being a friend of Independent Institute, George. We're grateful for that. I'm on your advisory board. Absolutely, yeah. You've been pivotal <laughs> to the development of this place and many other creative places. So again- Discovery Institute is there mine. There you go. We, we refer friends to our friends up in Seattle at the Discovery Institute. Uh, and again, thanks to George Gilder and thanks to everybody who joined us for today's independent conversation from the Independent Institute here in Oakland, California. Have a great day and please join us again. Thanks, George. Bye-bye. Thank you.